Oh, and welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of the development team at the Global Fund for Women, we are very excited um, to welcome you to our first expert discussion, which will be part of a bi-monthly series um, that we are holding to really engage our donors and our friends and activists around the world on the most pressing issues of the day. And so I'm really excited to be joined today um, by our president and CEO, Latanya Matt Fry, and also Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield. Just in terms of logistics, we had so many people sign up for this webinar today that we will be having a conversation, um, a small conversation amongst um, myself as the moderator and then um, our, our expert speakers. And then we will also open it up for questions um, about 30 minutes in. We will be taking questions through the Q&A function. So you should see that um, if you have any issues, we have um, tech teams and um, you can, uh, if you have any technical issues, you can put them in the Q&A chat, but we will be opening that up um, for questions through that function, just given um, the amount of people we expect on this call today. So I am extremely excited um, to be joined today to be, be discussing the U.S. elections, and I'm sure it's uh, top of mind for many people around the world, um, what is happening with the U.S. elections. Um, as we know, there are far-reaching consequences um, that have many different um, elements throughout the life, not just of people in the United States, but really around the world. Um, in anticipation of the US election day, um, November 3rd, we thought that it would be great to have a discussion and a dialogue about what the impact of the election is going to be on women, historically marginalized communities around the world, particularly the global South and East, and really just uh, narrowing in on the implications for women, girls, and marginalized people. Um, as you know, the Global Fund for Women is very interested in supporting our activists around the world that are fighting um, for those causes. So I'm pleased to be joined today by Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who I'm just in awe of every day and just very thankful that she is joining us today. I know you are very busy, Ambassador, and we are very, very thankful to have you today. Ambassador Lena Thomas-Greenfield has a tremendously distinguished career, uh, has been a, just a steward in the community, um, in the diplomatic community. She was ambassador to um, uh, Liberia, as well as served as U.S. Assistant Secretary for State for Foreign Affairs, where she led development and management of U.S. policy towards Sub-Saharan Africa, with a focus on economic empowerment, investment opportunities, peace and security, um, democracy and governance. And prior to that, um, as I mentioned, she had a distinguished 35 year long foreign service career where she served in different appointments from the uh, Director General of Foreign Service to the Director of Human uh, Resources, um, leading the team uh, within State Department's 70,000 personnel, so quite distinguished. And she's served in postings around the world, including the United Nations in Geneva, um, Kenya, Nigeria, I mentioned Liberia, where she served as ambassador, Pakistan, the Gambia, Jamaica, it goes on. Um, we're extremely excited to have her here today. Um, she is also a distinguished resident fellow in African Affairs at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University, and she serves as Senior Vice President at the Albright Stonebridge Group. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Ambassador. Happy to be here. And of course, secondly on the list, just because Ambassador <laughs> is, is being announced first, but our, um, our fearless leader, Latanya, who I know have known for years, and um, she is now President and CEO of Global Fund for Women, but I consider her a dear colleague and friend and have really, um, everywhere she goes, I follow because it's just, um, she's just that significant in my personal life and has been a, a mentor to me. 
She serves as our president and CEO, but has served um, in previous positions, including the executive director of Planned Parenthood Global. She has also um, served in the Foreign Service, and so we'll bring that sort of lens to the discussion today, and has served at UNICEF and um, as well as USAID in the past. And um, I did not know this, but she is an attorney by training and started her career at the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund and so in Washington, DC. And so that was a little piece of interesting um, trivia that you may not know. And so I am going to really start off, I mean, I think we all really are on pins and needles just because of the, um, the weight of this election this year, it, you know, is quite tremendous in not just lives of Americans, but lives of pretty much, you know, everyone around the world, really. Um, I am very interested to, you know, get an idea from you all, and I'll start with you, Ambassador, um, how you think U.S. foreign policy abroad, I mean, you've served in numerous roles in the U.S. government at State Department and have really been um, involved in I think shaping and leading um, US, U.S. foreign policy. How do you feel right now in terms of um, where you think what is at stake in these U.S. elections? Just kind of giving us a little bit of a, a, a level setting of where you think um, there are some real um, differences and real um, differences re regarding the administrations, but also just U.S. policy in general. Linda, you're on mute. I love that comment, you're on mute. Uh, that's an interesting question. And I think it's an important question as we are only two weeks out from, uh, uh, from the election here in the United States and the entire world is watching the lead up to our election and are anxiously waiting, awaiting the actual election and the results of, of that election. And when we hear constantly that this is the most consequential election of our times, it is the most consequential election uh, of our times. Because what is at stake uh, is perceptions as well as the reality of US democracy our leadership is at stake, our values are at stake, and confidence in our word is, is, is being questioned. So the world is watching to see if there will be uh, a change in, uh, in administration to see how the U.S. will move forward in the future. On the other side of the equation is what is happening here in the United States. We're in the middle of a pandemic. It's a global pandemic, but having a major impact here in the United States. Economic hardships across the board. We're seeing people standing in line for food. Uh, we have a voter process where voters' right to vote, uh, voters' rights are being suppressed. There's intimidation. Uh, there is fear of violence. These are things that you never expect to experience here uh, in the United States. And all of this is taken in the context of racial tensions like nothing we've seen, say, in the past 20 years. So this election is going to have an impact on all of these things. And women and girls, those four things that I just described, women and girls are impacted by those more than any other population in the United States. Thank you. I think I, I think that sets the tone for how significant and important this election is. And Latanya, um, could you give us your idea of sort of what you are feeling in terms of what's at stake? Particularly, Ambassador mentioned, you know, violence against girls. You know, the Global Fund for Women has a significant program um, for gender-based violence. And you know, just in your experience, you've you've done a lot of work around this. Um, wh wh how are you feeling? Wh what are your 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 feelings on that? 
Yeah, thank you, Rashida, and thank you for the, the really kind introduction. And I did want to just take a couple minutes to say um, thank you to, to Linda, to Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, who has been really, um, I mean, just a, a, as you expressed in her bio, a leader in this space, but also just speaking from someone who was in the Foreign Service, how important it was to have someone that looked like you, who didn't just see her role in the service as being, uh, you know, doing her job, but saw it as being a mentor, um, an example to all of us. And I, you know, and I, here I am some years later, we won't say how many, but um, it is so incredibly good to see that you continue to not just talk about who we are as a country, but to really practice those values. And so for me, this election, um, is it, it, it is what it means is that we have always been um, um, a country where our foreign policy um, policies have affected what has happened in so many countries, good and bad. And that's what I want to talk about. But I do feel like now what we're what we need again is that example. We need that North Star. And um, there's so much going on around the world, of course. I mean, we couldn't capture it here in this conversation. But who we are in the U.S. as a part of that is what I'm really concerned about. And how we show up in the fights for social justice and human rights is what's really um, super important to me right now. So these, you know, upcoming elections, um, whether I'm in Alabama, in Atlanta with my cousins, or whether I'm in Zimbabwe or Nepal, um, are extremely important, and people uh, know that. On our good days, when we have good moments in the U.S., we are a great beacon light for what can happen. We speak up for human rights. We we call out social injustice in the world. Um, but right now, I feel like what keeps coming up are these foreign policies around exploitation, domination, control. And so when I think about what's at stake, I think our ability to bat back against that really is at stake in this election. Um, we, uh, we risk and have, quite frankly, um, uh, uh, harmed communities. Um, when we're fundamentally responsible for some of the, creating some of the conditions that are happening um, that Linda talked about both in countries, but also here in the U.S. at home. Um, one of our uh, partners, a, a group called Madre, uh, I read the report and it said, um, our, it spoke to what I, I'm thinking, but it said, our futures, our democracy, and all of our health and well-being, as well as core values and demands for peace and justice depend on an urgent and radical reorientation of U.S. foreign and domestic policies. And I truly believe that. It's easier, I think, for us, um, particularly in the U.S., to think about military, right? Um, so militarism at home and abroad, they're connected. It's clear why they have to be connected. Um, but when we think about things like response to movements like Black Lives Matter, um, even what's happening in Nigeria with um, ending SARS movement, uh, you know, it's difficult for us to see that that one affects the other, um, but it really is true. So what's at stake is really the state violence, authoritarianism, and white supremacy. I mean, which didn't start here, but hell, we are, you know, it doesn't begin or end with the U.S., but we are definitely looked at. You handle these things, what we say about these things in the face of um, strife. And so these are going to be challenges for us. And this election is going to um, help us um, see how we want to respond to those issues. And countries will see how we respond and hopefully either embolden them to do bad if we go one way or hopefully give them an example of how we can do this better together. So whether it's Black Lives Matter or Maria Verde or the NSARS, um, at Global Fund for Women, we really do want to um, see civil society partner with government and that this um, push for uh, citizens to protest and organize and march and build movements is actually welcomed by this administration, by the next administration, should I say. And that when women are on the front lines in particular, that they get special protection, not that they're kicked while they're down. Um, and so we know that uh, movements and civil society and government partnerships have helped uh, with workplace regulations. It's um, helped with land rights issues over the last few decades, better access to fintech, legal protections for domestic workers. I mean, the list goes on, protection from sexual harassment. And that's what I'm super, super 
I would say excited that a new administration can bring, um, but super concerned if we don't go in that direction. Oh. I mean, I'm, I'm nervous, but I'm also, I'm also just understanding, you know, how many things, as you mentioned, are, are really, are really at stake in not just our daily lives, but um, lives around the world. So I wanted to follow up on this, on this question, because I think it's important for us to understand, Ambassador, um, how, you know, I think about, just as an example, um, LaTanya mentioned the NSARS, you know, and, and just being frantic to try and figure out how we could, um, uh, you know, get an official, announce, you know, official word out, official, um, so, sort of like the U.S. government, um, having started my career there as well at the Department of Commerce, you know, you have this idea that like, well, the U.S. government should say something. Like, who is going to say something? Um, the the voice. We talked a little bit before about the voice of of the U.S. and the role of U.S. leadership, you know, in in global affairs has somewhat changed. And when did these changes occur? And how can we get back to where we were when you saw something happening around the world or even in the United States, you just knew that the US government or someone was had your back, you know, had your back and was able to just to, to have, you know, amplify the voices on the ground. How do we get back there? Uh, civil society organizations, community organizations, youth groups, all press, uh, they all look to the U.S. Uh, to express its views when something is happening uh, in their country. And the reason they want that is because our views are, were respected. And, and we brought some oomph behind those, those expressions of, of our views. Uh, countries listen to us. Sometimes they didn't, they weren't happy about what we said, but they listened to us because they knew that there, there was something behind it. And not only was there something behind it, there was a true sense of, of commitment behind it, that we actually believed it and we wanted to make a difference. And we could show the example in our own country. It's not perfect. We're still dealing with racism 400 years later, but there's an example where we've seen progress and that we could continue to make progress. I, I think in the past three and a half years, thereabouts, uh, that voice has diminished. And it, is, it has not been a negative voice. It's been a voice that is not saying anything. It's been a silent voice. And that voice has been missed. I will um, uh, note that uh, uh, as this situation is evolving in, in Nigeria, that there is a sense that the U.S. needs to say something. But also on the other side of that is this sense of how dare them say something. They killed a black man in the streets. Uh, their policeman shot a man sitting in the seatbelt of, of his car. So you, you don't have the right to tell us how to deal with uh, situations uh, in, our, in our country. So that is a problem as well. So as you talk about go, do, going back to do it the way we used to, actually, as, as we have continually heard, we have to do it better. We have to do it differently. We have to be even more impactful and more effective in making sure that our voice is heard, but it's also our example, that in addition to our voice, our example is one that people respect. And right now, our example is not respected. Thank you for that. I, I, I appreciate those comments about us being better and, and pushing ourselves to be better. I think that that's really important. Um, Latanya, to that point about sort of the interconnection of, you know, just the world, we've seen with global uh, COVID-19, just how interconnected we really are. And I think Ambassador uh, Thomas Greenfield mentioned, and I think it's a really good point that, you know, the U.S. has maybe oftentimes um, officially had, you know, a, a particular voice 
outside of the US, right? And then maybe inside sort of towards domestic policy or um, agendas within the US may have been different. So what do you think is the role of like civil society and funders, uh, philanthropy around this issue of like us all kind of getting better together and how do we, how do we do that? Yeah, um, and, and I, you know, I'll have to agree um, with um, the ambassador that we are going to have to be a better example for sure. Um, I think that's where it's going to have to start. But I do think standing behind um, and having um, uh, the courage to stand behind um, acts, um, uh, fighting against acts of injustice everywhere is going to be where I believe um, uh, much of that courage is going to come from. I think the sheer numbers of us, um, when you look at what's happening around the world, of how many people are trying to be heard um, as they try to access justice. Uh, COVID-19 is an example of a pandemic where, you know, everyone is affected, and, but it's affecting some people far worse. And it's not a surprise because it happens every day. And of course, now that we have these opportunities to see these intersectional injustices happening around a pandemic, we can't just sit quiet and be like, that's a shame. You know, It's like, we've got to do the work now to make sure that the journey from here to where we're trying to go gets closer. And that only happens when there is a connection between what's happening in the community, like what I feel, what impacts my children, impacts this community, and then that community impacts the countries we live in and the world that we live in. And we've got to see it like that because otherwise it seems insurmountable or we, we can't get to it or what difference does it make whether it's Trump or Biden? You know, if we start to get like that, we will start regressing and we've seen it. I mean, it's been, you said three and a half years, it feels like so much longer. Yeah, <laughs> but we it see is. The regression happen. And we're not alone. I mean, there are so many other countries. I was talking to my colleague in Brazil, Zimbabwe. I mean, they also are, you know, really trying to hold the line. They're members of civil society who are trying to remember that journey and where we're trying to get to. We are by no means there yet. But if we start regressing now, I mean, we're in trouble. And so I do, I do fundamentally believe that um, continuing to have courage to stand up, to talk, um, to talk uh, truth to what's happening in the world is gonna be hugely important. And then that we set our examples, um, uh, lift our examples, should I say, up. Because there is a lot of good that's happening. There's a lot of people working on stuff um, around the world um, that leads us to a more just society that are coming up with ideas of how we do that um, despite the challenges we have in front of us. And we have to lift up those voices as well. Um, uh, and, and so for me, it is fundamentally um, a question of not so much that we're connected because we know we are, and that won't end. I mean, whichever administration comes through, we'll still be super connected, but I think it goes to what Linda is saying. So, but what voice do we hear from this country as we speak to the rest of the world um, about who we are and what we could be, not just as a country, but in this world. So that, that's hugely important to me. And I, I wanna support organizations everywhere that are trying to move through that journey and where we have some resources and that's not just money, but that's everything um, to bring that to bear to the, to the movements that are trying to work through these issues. And Rashida, if I could add something, you know, it's not just about national elections. Mm -hmm also about local elections, wherever you are in the world. It's the people who are directly connected to the community. For the first time, when I voted this time, I actually looked at who was on, who was running for uh, school boards. Because at that level, decisions are made about how your children will be educated. And you will have decisions telling your teachers that they can't teach about the 619 uh, uh, project, that they can't teach about slavery. Uh, so at that level, it is important that we vote. We need to vote for state legislators who will not allow for gerrymandering our uh, uh, political districts. We need to vote for governors who will take care of 
the issues that relate to our states. And then we need to vote for congressmen and senators who will reflect our views when they go to, to Washington. The president is important, but a lot of what presidents are able to do happen because they're, the balance of power is out of sync. And that's what we're seeing right now, because we didn't express our views by voting for our senators and voting for uh, representatives who represent our views. No, absolutely. That's, that's, an, that's a very important point. And I'm, I'm glad that you made that because I think um, for the first time, like you mentioned, um, I'm, I'm very excited that so many people have um, already voted. And I think that now people are starting to realize how important, um, not even just uh, what's on the ballot, but those who are on the ballot, their links to judges and um, you know, all of these other institutions that really affect our daily lives, in addition to that, affect the, um, the sort of what goes up in terms of um, allocations or um, what, is, what is priority for, you know, the Hill or for, for other, um, other things like the Farm Bill. I mean, there's just so much, there's, there's a lot of complexity there, but it starts with kind of understanding where your... Um, where the political process and in, in, in encouraging people to get involved in the political process. Um, I think now we are um, nearing the time where we are going to be looking for questions from the audience. Um, really appreciate um, the comments so far, but want to give an opportunity um, to the audience to really ask some questions. Um, Ambassador, you weren't on this call, but we had a a smaller call a few weeks ago and it was very lively um, with so many questions about uh, about what's happening in the U.S. and sort of what was going on with with the elections and so we know that there are going to be um, a number of comments so we have um, opened up the question and answer for um, anyone to ask a question um, and I can definitely be moderating those as they go. But um, while we're waiting on that um, for people to populate those, I want to ask both of you what you are hopeful for in this election coming up. Because I want to, you know, as much as we have so many things that are at stake, I think there are real opportunities. Um, as well. Um, I'm hopeful that, you know, so many people have voted in early election. I think it's amazing. Um, and I think, you know, let's start with, let's, let's lead into the questions because I'm sure that there are going to be a lot of <laughs> what's going on with, with the one thing that um, we're really hopeful about for, for this coming election. You know, I am hopeful that the fervor and the uh, commitment that we're seeing now, the, the energy that we're seeing among people lining up to vote, voting early, uh, expressing themselves by demonstrating in the streets, signs in front of their houses. I, this didn't, this is the first time that I've ever seen so much uh, fervor in an, in an election. And regardless of who wins and we need to continue that. We need to continue to stay involved in the political process. Uh, and then the second uh, hope I have is that young people remain engaged. So many young people have engaged. I remember a year ago being in DC for uh, the March for Our Lives and there were so many young people on the stage and I just remember tears rolling out of my eyes as I heard those young people talking. And some of them are voting and many of them will be voting in a year or two. That's our future. And I hope that they continue to, to uh, remain committed. Thank you. I have to agree with the ambassador. I mean, I, so Linda, my, my son was, um, I, I guess he was 17 at the last, in 2016 at the election. 
Um, and so, but he was truly taken aback that this country voted in the current um, uh, president, um, personally offended. Um, and so I told him, you're not gonna wait four years to wait in, to vote in another president. I told him exactly what you were saying. It's like every year since then, we have gone in and this year we will not because we're doing we're early voting, but we've gone together to vote so that um, he can do exactly what you're saying. Look at who is running in your community. Look at what they're saying. Look how they're responding to our leadership and how that affects your immediate needs. Um, and so hopefully it's been a process of our younger uh, generation to, to think about these things much broader than just uh, their own personal affront to uh, who, who the person is in the White House, but really about what their vote means and how that counts. And I am confident about that. I'm confident that they're learning as they go, but they're also, they're not staying quiet. You know, they're talking about what they want and they're talking about what it means to represent me. You know, and so I'm happy about that. Um, I will also say um, there's one, uh, another thing, um, Rashida, that I think of, which I think is important, is that a lot of times we know that policies might not be good, but we might not sort of track it or hold an administration accountable to the impact that a policy has had. And I'm, I'm mostly thinking about the global gag rule um, or the Mexico City policy and how it's been hugely expanded. There has been a lot of work, you know, some of it I'm proud to be a part of it. A lot of our grantee partners, um, are working on it um, to actually document what's happening. So when you remove funds for healthcare because of a particular lean um, or, or desire to limit, um, in this case, abortion care, then what are the other implications? And I've seen now um, reports from Nigeria, Kenya, Madagascar, um, Nepal and have spoken personally to a lot of uh, organizations that are working on health services, even for like tuberculosis and malaria that have now suffered under this policy. And the fact that we're keeping all of that data, that we're collecting it so that we can show it to the next administration or quite frankly, anybody that asks, I mean, but even State Department even says that policy is, is, is hard, you know, not good for uh, the, what's happening with our um, health work overseas. But I say that because I think having the data to show, um, collecting data, specifically disaggregated data, looking at the cross intersections of race, class, and, and gender is just so important to how we tell our story for marginalized communities and how we can stand up and talk with faith about what's happening uh, with women uh, in particular, but all people um, because of a flip of a pen over here in the US. And so I, I am confident that that is something that we'll be able to use as we go into the next administration, um, but also a habit that I think as a democratic structure, as a democratic country, we have to get in the habit of collecting the stories, getting the data right, and able an ability to present that as, as we go. No, that's, um, that's you must have already known that there, there was a, a couple of questions about um, priorities related to women's health and sort of policy changes. So I'm, I'm glad that you addressed that, um, uh, Latanya, that's really helpful. Um, we're, we're starting to get in questions. So I'm gonna start with um, Meredith. Um, Meredith asks, we often discuss US impact on the world. Conversely, what can the US learn from our global partners? That, that's an excellent question. And as we deal with this COVID uh, pandemic, uh, I've had a number of conversations with former President Sirleaf on how Liberia dealt with uh, the Ebola crisis uh, uh, that had a devastating impact, but they actually brought it under control and ended it. And what we have learned from that experience is that leadership is important. Partnerships are important. It's just, you know, you can't do it by yourself. Partnerships are important. How you communicate is important. All of those things are missing now as we deal with the COVID crisis here. So we certainly can learn from countries how they have approached these types of pandemics or epidemics or uh, uh, crises and how they got through the crises. What were the variables? Uh, and again, I think leadership is, is, is a key variable in, in all of this. Uh, the second is people are important. 
you know, how we deal with issues uh, related to people. How do you talk to your people? How do you take care of your people? Uh, I tend to always fall on Liberia because I spent so many years studying Liberia, living in Liberia, uh, working through Liberia, and I saw the evolution of President Sirleaf's uh, leadership. And I use her as well because she's a woman and her leadership style was different. Uh, she was a compassionate leader. So compassion is important. You have people who are dying. They need to know their leaders care. Uh, they may know you can't save their lives, but at least they know you care. And being able to express that compassion uh, is, is a key thing that we can learn uh, from some of our, some of our partners ac across the uh, globe. I, I have to agree. Rashida, should I respond quickly? Um, or are you have any questions you want to ask? Sure. Uh, I'm sorry. We, we had so many questions. I was just going to keep <laughs> keep going because the, the next one is for you, LaDanya. Um, so I am going to combine two. Um, appreciate you making the point about having to do better. Um, LaTanya, could you give some examples of uh, specific policy changes um, that you would like to see, particularly related to either health, women's health? Um, there's also a question about Roe v. Wade. Um, like to get some examples about, you mentioned the data collection, and I think that's super important. I think there's a lot of fear um, that, that uh, individuals have about what may be happening with specific policy and um, interested, they're interested in seeing like what um, we, some specific examples that we would like to, to see in particularly women's health. So yeah, I mean, I, I like probably most of us on this call are a little bit worried about Roe and, and our Supreme Court um, current situation is, probably not great. But then what I think about is how Roe even got to the Supreme Court. And it was because women took to the streets. So women stood up, um, civil society together with a number of uh, state leadership and governments um, had uh, the sense to kind of think about what was required um, for women's health. What was so important about the right to choose? Because it wasn't just a fundamental sort of um, exercise. It actually spoke to a number of things that even many other countries are, are thinking um, about, which is the, the, you know, the maternal mortality um, which in our country is still quite poor in the south of our country, and how much of that comes from um, unintentional pregnancies or uh, uh, terminations that are not are done outside of the medical structure. And so many of those things, I think, are at risk, but it doesn't negate that there's not one switch that's going to go off. Uh, you know, after November to say this is good or bad, there is still going to require uh, the civil response. So people have to stand up and say what they want. And I think um, if nothing else, our country has been good about doing that. And I believe that that is what we have to look to, especially as we understand from the data how much what we do here impacts others overseas, which is what we're talking about here. And I'll tell you, there was one... Um, I don't know how many people remember, but at least twice, I know 17 and 19, and maybe uh, before that, uh, the HER Act, which is the Health Empowerment and Rights Act, was put forward in Congress. Um, and, you know, and each time it gets more and more co-sponsors on the bill, but I think it was led by um, Shaheen and, and Lowy. Um, but this was a, it wasn't a bill that just said, you know, uh, you can't, you got to outlaw the global gag rule. It was a bill that talks about who we are in response to our foreign assistance, right? It's saying we cannot put those kind of restrictions on countries when we ourselves um, have legalized something here. So whether that's abortion or something else, um, we can't restrict it somewhere else if we can do it here or if that country has gone through a legal process that says they can do it there. So I know that things like the HER Act are, are what gets us to um, and legislation and policies that are going to increase our ability to be able to protect rights here in the U.S. as well as overseas. And then I, you know, and I have to put it out there because I think it's so important. 
is electing more women around these issues. I know it probably doesn't seem like it. We just had a, the confirmation hearings of a woman for Supreme Court. But I do believe having more women and spaces, uh, especially political spaces, but also across the board, across sectors, is going to allow us to be able to have conversations around policies like this um, that will help us get to a space that's much more protective of human rights than we have been um, in the past. So in some ways I see the angst, but I'm confident we can get over them um, if we have the right leadership, if we encourage more women to be in these spaces, and if we as, as civil participants, civil society stand up. Thank you for that. So the next question that we have comes from Amina. Amina says, but what happens when the political process is no longer safe? particularly for Black folks in the United States, or as an example, young people in Nigeria. I mean, I think, you, you know, you can go on looking at Thailand and protests other places in the world. Like, what happens? What do we do? You know, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, my, my immediate thought is we just keep fighting. Uh, we keep showing up, we keep lining up. Um, and when I say fight, I don't mean fight uh, violently or physically. I mean, uh, it's commitment. And this is what we saw during the civil rights movement in, in the United States. And, you know, I'm always reminded of John Lewis saying, we have to vote like our lives depend on it. That's what we have to do. We have to vote like our lives depend on it and just keep doing it until we can make a difference. If we curl up in a, in a corner and go home, take our votes home and put them in our, our back pocket, we get nothing from that. Uh, we've got to vote and our lives do depend on it. Latanya. Do you have thoughts on that question? Yeah, I was just thinking about Audre Lorde, you know, I, I can't remember the poem, I'm just trying to call it, but you know, in essence, what it was saying was that transformative change never happens without a fight. And I'll caveat it with that doesn't necessarily mean that we're out shooting and, you know, uh, physically having um, fights, but it does mean that we have to push back. So we see something disappearing um, that we respect and we love and we need, we have to fight to, to keep it. And that was the whole thing I was saying about regressing, you know, we're, we're still on that journey four or 500 years later of trying to get to a space where every individual is respected for who they are. Um, and so that fight continues. And so the political process is one piece of that. And I completely agree with the ambassador that we have to push back, you know, and so if we see that space closing, we gotta, you know, like, Get out I there. With our vote. We got to, you know, we got to open it back up and put people into leadership in that space that's going to continue to open it up for us so that we don't feel like it's unsafe to participate in our own political processes here and around the world. Thank you for that. Um, so, Anne, um, there's, a, there's a lot of questions about, about women's health and understandably so. Um, Anne asks, with the possibility of Roe versus Wade being overturned, what is Global Fund for Women's stance on the Jane Network and other underground abortion provider services? Well, I, I mean, I'll just answer um, briefly. You know, that was what I was saying. What, like, we didn't just, Roe versus Wade didn't drop out of the sky. It was a lot of work that was happening in response to what was a lot of deaths, unnecessary deaths that were happening in our country. And I have been involved in those same movements in a numerous, at least 12 other countries um, intimately uh, around the world who are also fighting to save lives. And so when I, you know, think about Global Fund for Women, of course, we fund primarily outside of the United States. And so I'll speak to that more than I can to the U.S., but we continue to fund um, movements that might be considered adversive to current governments um, and Global Fund for Women. We don't have a criteria uh, that says um, you necessarily have to go with the status quo to get our funding. In fact, most of the women and um, activists and human rights leaders that seek funding from us, and particularly as we look to collective action, are probably fighting against something um, that in their, whether it's in their governments or their cultures, um, have been repressive to, to, the, to the communities. 
And so we continue to see collective action as the way that you fight back against these activities. And so when we see um, across the world, uh, women are fighting continuously at the front lines around women's health and reducing maternal mortality. And we continue to want to support that work everywhere. And just personally, I would here too as well. Thank you, LaTanya. I always love your answers because I always feel like so much better after them. I'm like, yes, exactly. So here's a question. Um, and I think about like, so I have this on my desk because um, this was one of our book club. So this is Angela Davis, Freedom is a Constant Struggle. And it's about um, the, uh, the foundations of a movement. And we read this in uh, the book club, um, the Global Fund for Women book club. And there's a question about um, movement. So I'm excited because I got to, to, to drop my, uh, my plug for this book, um, <laughs> which, which is a really good book, by the way, um, that uh, allows you to understand how movements and how human rights is so connected to your own rights. And I think that that's super important. Um, we have a question from Josie that asks about what do you both consider are the top three women's movements um, that can have the best opportunity to be effective if the administration does not change in this election? Hmm. I don't know that I can list the top three movements, but I can list the the top three actions uh, that I think women, as well as others, uh, need to take. Uh, one, they need to express their dissatisfaction and they need to express it early. Uh, and that's a simple thing. It's just like, we're not happy. This is what we, why we voted for you. This is what we want. The second is express that dissatisfaction by voting. Mm -hmm. uh, and voting in large numbers and making sure that uh, they get broad support from other uh, political arms. And then the third is what we saw so many women do uh, uh, in, in terms of the, um, uh, the women's march. We need to get out there in the streets mm -hmm. and, and make sure that our voices are, are heard. So that's what I would argue. I don't know that a single movement or a single three movements as organizations can have an impact if they don't have 10,000 voices behind them. Uh, so we need numbers. We need voices. We need voters. I absolutely, and I actually think voting is an act of resistance. So I love it. <laughs> a movement tool. <laughs> um, yes. I do think... Um, you know, it's interesting when you say despite the administration, because they're so far apart. I mean, it's, it's like night and day. But I do think, um, uh, you know, women's leadership uh, in different spaces, I think we've seen a lot of movement um, towards just increasing the sheer numbers of women that are in spaces that are important. Yes. Um, so the hope is, I think like we talked about President Shirley, that that kind of compassion, that difference in the way that we lead will be a balance. Mm -hmm necessary here and in, in, in other uh, places in the world. So I do think that that will continue. Um, I do think the movement around women's health is just going to be continuously, I mean, uh, it, it is, it, we're the mothers and the, you know, I mean, it, it's just, uh, it makes sense it, for the longevity of our own cultures and communities um, for us to focus on women's health to make sure we're included in research I mean, COVID is a, a classic example. Are we looking at the nuances around not just uh, women as a group, but within that group, how we're different and how we respond differently to different things. So I think women's health will continue to be a movement that will thrive um, as we go forward, not to say without hiccups or without pushback, but will thrive. And then I, I also think about the um, movement against gender-based violence. I do, um, I have been so heartened by all of the um, uh, uh, response to um, pushing back against gender-based violence around the world, um, not just here in the US, but we have learned so much by our sisters and the work that they're doing to look at this at so many different levels. I think 
um, you know, whether it's from the grass tops to the grassroots, you know, how we deal with this. Um, we at Global Fund for Women have just joined a partnership with uh, Me Too. Um, and, and, and all of the sort of Me Too movements that are happening on, around the world, trying to come together collectively to look at best practices and to make sure we haven't excluded a certain group by the work that we've been doing um, uh, with Me Too. So, uh, you know, I do think those three, and there's probably many others, but I, I don't think an administration, uh, and, and Linda mentioned this, will, will be the sort of... Uh, end all. So whichever, you know, it won't say that if this one is in, then we don't need to keep fighting for gender-based violence. Because even if Biden is in and we have hella support from the administration, we still got to work on it. We still have that 10,000 voices that she's talking about. We still need them. Even if you have a supportive government, we saw that in other administrations. So I think movements are going to be required wherever and they don't stop because someone is voted in or out, but they keep going. A couple, um, and also as well. So our last question is um, related to climate change. Um, so how do women influence, as we know, uh, women and, and girls, marginalized communities are often um, very affected by what is happening with climate change around the world. And the, the US has really used to be sort of a leader in, in you know, supporting um, different accords and different, um, you know, funding, different research, and um, really at the forefront of, you know, uh, science and trying to get out in front of what is happening um, with climate change. Where do you both feel like women can have influence related to resource rights um, and particularly around climate change in this this new administration, where do we begin? I know that's very specific, but uh, it's been asked a couple times. Well, I think Latanya gave us the, a perfect answer. Women need to be at the table uh, and be part of the decision process. Uh, I think the first thing a, a new administration will have to do is go back into the Paris um, climate change uh, agreement uh, but we need to have strong voices of women at the table bringing to the discussion the impact that climate change has on, on women and what needs to be done to address the issues that we all face, but particularly uh, that women face. When you look at Africa and the number of women who are, are working in agriculture, uh, they see the impact impact of climate change, women who are carrying water, women who are carrying firewood, all of those things need to be addressed in the context of how we talk about the impact of climate change. They have other uh, uh, things that they impact as well, but they're all a result of climate change. And so that has to be part of the discussion and how to support women uh, to mitigate the impact that it's having on their lives. Yeah, and, and so I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, I saw, uh, I think it was yesterday, the, uh, like a trailer clip for I Am Greta, which is one of the, um, it's, a, it's a documentary I think Netflix or somebody will put out. And, um, and I couldn't help but um, wondering why we need over something that is fundamentally, and I, I'll throw out the science, but I don't know, it's like common sense what's happening um, needs to be addressed. Um, it needs some positive, um, thoughtful leadership across the world. Um, needs to al We always need to sort of put a face on things. Um, and some of you may have seen that there was, I think at the, um, you know, one of the larger uh, government meetings, um, I wanna call it the G8, but it was, uh, it was, Greta was in the picture and so was a number of other adolescent girls and they cut out the black one, you know, the one from Africa. And so yeah. um, I think if we're gonna get to this, we have to lift up um, voices. And I think what Linda was referring to as far as, you know, the agriculture, you know, women farmers, um, the, the girls who are carrying the water for two, three, five miles every morning and every evening um, to, to make the big change that we're looking for. We can't just look for an answer um, 
and with big sort of, uh, you know, companies and stuff like that, we have to also look at the various uh, constituencies that are affected by these things every time there's a hurricane and what they're trying to do in their countries and support that work. And certainly now I'm talking about Global Fund for Women. If we want to make that big change in climate, you know, the climate crisis, we have to work on those little changes. We have to support women who are doing things to make their communities more resilient. And they are. They're doing it. Um, they're working on it. They're coming up with solutions. I remember I used to get an email every morning of one thing you could do today, you know, to change the direction of the climate crisis. Um, and those are the things that I'm thinking um, we're going to have to focus on instead of always just looking for that one big uh, representation or answer to come from somebody else. I think we're going to have to start looking within and then supporting community efforts that are really at the heart of trying to change who we are as a culture and look for other technologies that are going to help us, uh, you know, change the, the tide. So, so I, you know, I think that's fundamentally a global fund for women, what we try to do, which is, you know, sort of bring it on down to what it means at home to be able to make these major changes that look insurmountable, but definitely are not. And they don't just affect this one or that one. It affects all of us. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank you both. Um, this has been an amazing and lively discussion. I think um, that, you know, appreciate the audience and all the questions. This was our first one and I couldn't be happier about um, how this went. And I'm sure that um, the, the audience, uh, there, were, there were a few more questions, but this is all the time that we had. And like so many of the other events that we've had, it's, it's things that we will continue to talk um, to our communities, um, to our activists. And I think that both of you have given us a lot to chew on and to think on. And I think for me personally, um, I'm really inspired by the work that both of you all have been doing throughout your career. And um, I think that we, you know, as younger people are really inspired to take on um, our role in the movement and really get out there and not just help get drive people to the polls. I'm gonna be working <clears throat> at a polling, at a polling um, station uh, for the first time ever. And I know a bunch of our other colleagues um, at the Global Fund for Women are gonna be doing that as well. So I think that this conversation is just um, really has helped us um, to get some ideas and to feel hopeful um, moving into the, the next two weeks. So I really appreciate Ambassador, your time. You're, you're always you know, showing up for us. We are very thankful. Um, Latanya, thank you so much. Really appreciate your leadership and everything you're doing um, at Global Fund for Women. The, the new things that we have, I think it's very inspiring. So I just want to thank you both um, for this really, really insightful conversation. And um, it seems like a few have been adding to, to the chat saying, I really enjoy the conversation and learning. So I think that we did our job here today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It was great being here. The time went by so fast. I could spend another hour. Well, we might have to call you again after the election. <laughs> thank you. I, I look forward to it. Thank, thank you all very much for your time. Bye-bye. You. Do you want to add anything else? Um, Latanya, do you want to add anything else? I don't know, and I hope I wasn't supposed to, but I, you know, of course, I just want to thank the ambassador for her time. Um, I don't know if people know um, how incredible it is to be able to have her in our space, to have her think together with us, and, you know, and just the, the walk the walk, always you have, you know, you're always speaking and walking towards the values that I think I hold dear for sure, but I think as a community that we all hold dear, so please let us know how we can continue to support the work that you do. Both like your lives depend on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you all for attending. Bye, everyone.